of all, Lucinda. It's a great story and one of the few female entrepreneurs in the tech space. All right, so here's Lucinda. So I'm uh, going to talk for about 20 minutes and then maybe even less and, ha and spend most of my time just answering any questions that you have. Um, by way of very brief background, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm on my fifth company right now. Uh, this one's in the food space, but all the others have been uh, enterprise software companies. I've raised 12 rounds of venture capital for those five companies, so um, I've done it all through, I've, I've had a couple big hits and I've had a couple go sideways and I had one astoundingly go belly up after we got it to 25 million in sales and 5 million in EBITDA. Um, so all kinds of things can happen and I'm happy to answer questions in any vein. Um, I thought I would tell, actually I had, I had a dinner tonight with Kevin and uh, Burke who's here and I asked him sort of, well, what do people here want to hear about? And I know sort of looking out at you, I'm assuming how many people actually are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs? Eh, most of you, not everybody, but most of you. Um, the, the hot topic is always money. How do you get money? How do you raise money? And so I'm just going to tell a couple of cautionary tales, real life stories, that try to sort of pull in what it really is like to do this um, at, at some degree of scale. And, and my experience comes from running my own companies and also being on boards. I'm on the board right now of a, of a company that's going crazy, super successful. So it's a pretty wide, and, I've, and the, all my friends are people who do this too. So it comes from a pretty, a pretty wide base of experience. And to, to, but to frame these two stories about raising money um, or about the foibles of, of sort of what can happen, um, I want to start by saying, you know, most entrepreneurs are so focused on raising money and it is completely the wrong thing to be focused on. So I feel a little bit hypocritical to be telling, spending my time here with you talking about that, but I know it's the thing that's got the mystery and everybody sort of wants to know how it works and I do it, so I'll, so I'll do that. You know, I, um, it was funny because I sat down, sat down to dinner and, and we recently uh, announced a raise that we actually did in April, but we just announced it. We, um, we got, had a press conference with Mayor Nutter and he was head of the conference of mayors and so that was the first date we could get. Um, and, and Kevin said, congratulations. And I said, I don't understand why everyone says congratulations when you raise money. I just, it may, it's completely mysterious to me. You have exchanged a piece of your child, essentially, for some cash which you are going to pay more for than any other dollar you ever borrowed. Credit cards at, at max rates are cheaper than venture capital is, right? They're looking for 10x returns. Where is that coming from? It's yours. There's nothing to be sort of happy about. That said, if you need the money to get things going, you need the money to get things going, the first question is to ask, do you really need the money to get things going? Right, and my experience is usually no, you don't. We um, we went the first year with, at Real Food Works without raising money. I mean, I put I put some in, not not really actually that much. Um, so first, do you? You need to if the company needs to scale for competitive reasons, or if you have big infrastructure costs and you can't borrow it. Other than that, don't. Right, get people to work for free. If you have a real thing, people will believe in it. They'll just do it. They will. I have vast experience with this. Um, but that said, so you raised some money. So the first time I raised um, money, background is um, I had worked at a couple startups. I was young. I, there was a technology, a tech founder, a company called Destiny Software. There were two tech guys and they were looking for a marketing person. And through a long convoluted thing I won't bore you with, I ended up as a CEO. So I'd never done anything before. I'm, I don't know how old was I, I was 32 or something. And, um, and I'm a girl, which is really not what enterprise software, especially in those days, was looking for. It was way worse even then. And um, so we raised money, and we ended up, we did um, a presentation at uh, what was then, it's now whatever the big, I can't think of the name of it, the big venture conference that they alternate between DC and, and Philly, and we won best early stage software company. And so we're going through, we had it was tons of interest, we had multiple term sheets, and so we ended up raising money from some, from a fund in Virginia, Northern Virginia. We raised a million dollars, which in, in the, in, in, it's like a five million series A now, right? That was a lot of money then, this is 1996, 1995, a lot of money. So we raised the money and um, we scale up and things are going super well, except that we're missing our overall numbers, not by a lot. And for an early stage company in retrospect, I didn't know this because I'd never done it before then. And this was before blogs, literally this was before blogs. So you didn't have like 80 things you could go read about how this worked. You had to actually 
sort of figure it out on your own and just ask people. So we're doing well, but not quite as well as we should be. And one of the really critical things when we're now going to raise our Series B is um, the support of the Series A. Right, so the first thing is Series B investor, potential Series V. And, and these are all also one of the things that's changed in that time frame is everything's moved over one. So now we call what used to be called Series A, Series Seed. So really I'm raising a Series A, which everybody faked because you, everybody was ending up at Series G and Series H and that sounded bad. So if you, I'm really serious. I mean, I did it too. I was right in it when this all happened. So we all moved it back one. But at this, so I'm raising essentially Series A, right? And so the first question those investors have is, are your Series A guys in? And what's my answer? Absolutely my Series A guys are in, right? So I'm going through this and it's tough. Raising money is tough. And then there was less money available, so it was tougher. So I found some guys um, and I got a term sheet and I was so excited. Series Bs or Series As now are really notoriously difficult to raise. Does anybody know why they're notoriously difficult to raise? Because what happens? You take your first round of investment, what do you do with it? You spend it. You and how do you spend it? We're in software, what do we do? We hire people. Which means your burn is like this, right? So your burn's ahead of your revenue. So what's happening? You took this big pot of money, your cash balance is going like this, and if you're a Series B investor, what is your interest? Your interest is to watch that sucker go as low as it will go because guess what? And I have experienced this, I'll tell you a 2009 story. You get hungrier and hungrier and you will take money at any terms, right? So the Series B investors basically standing around, they're all standing around looking at each other and no one will step up and lead and they're all interested. As soon as you have a lead, now it's all, but you can't get the first one to move because they are essentially colluding. Whether it's overt or covert, they're colluding. So they're waiting for you to run out of money, so nobody steps forward. So I finally get one. These wonderful guys, dear friends in Long Island. So they come in and they say, great, we'll, we'll, we'll put the money in. I'm at this point like about 45 days from running out of money. This is a big relief. And um, I get the fax term sheet and I call my, my Series C, Series A, my first, my first round guys and say, great news, we've got a lead, and I walk through sort of the deal structure, and you just have to do your pro rata, which was whatever it was, half a million bucks or something. And the guy says, uh, about that, and pulls out. So, what happens now? So you're the guy in Long Island, what do you do? You pull out. Of course you pull out because the one who's been living with us for the last year and a half just pulled out. What does he know? He knows something I don't know. So um, that was really bad. That was really bad. And uh, here I sit with 35 employees and 45 days of cash. Um, and what did we do? So what we did was I had a wonderful um, VP of sales. He worked subsequently twice more for me. Now he's a CEO. He moved to the Valley. He's got a, he's got a sales automation company. Um, so we got in a room and I said to my management team, um, where are we going to come up with it? Well, these were the old days of enterprise software with big integration contracts. And we had a deal that was sitting waiting to be decided on at um, Bank of America's commercial credit card business. And so it was about... It was, it was about a $2 million deal and we were going to get, in those days you used to get a big chunk up front, so you'd get kind of the license up front and some of the services and then you get the services, the rest. So we were going to get about, three, quarter, about uh, three quarters of a million dollars as soon as the thing was signed. So we thought, well, and we had other deals with them, not with this unit. So we thought, okay, well, let's get that, right? That's the answer is go get, which there's a real moral of the story, the savior is the customer, right? Because if you're... If you're providing huge value to a customer, you can get cash from that customer. One of the things in my current company, which we'll talk about briefly at the end, is um, we're looking at doing a Kickstarter or a or a or an Indiegogo campaign, basically financing the growth of the business with customer pre-orders. Because our customers are passionate about what we do, they want it. Let's use their capital, and then I don't have to give up that chunk of my company I don't want to. So we go to so we get this. My 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 Mike Smalls, my head of sales, says. Well, let's, let's give them a discount. We'll tell them that we have an equity trigger. It's true. It 
very concrete terms. And if we can get this contract signed before the end of next week, it's worth a lot to us, so we'll give them a discount of 50 grand. So, it's going to cost us 50 grand this thing, right? So, turns out the guy who has to sign the contract is on, vac is on a vacation in Bermuda. We have great relations with customers. We get through the thing. We, we fax him a thing, his staff did, that said, if you sign this contract now while you're on vacation, we're going to get this 50 grand off, and we're going to do it anyway, so why not save the 50 grand? So the guy, it's a Thursday. The guy signs the thing, faxes it back to us. This is Bank of America, acquired by Nations Bank the next Monday, and all contracts were killed. We got our three quarters of a million dollars because it was before the deadline. It enabled me to call the guy in Long Island and say, you know, we're all right. And he ended up coming in leading, and ultimately, I don't remember, he probably put 15 million in the company over time. Because it was, it, we showed our mettle, right? We showed that we understood how to put it together. So the, so the morals of those, there's a lot of morals in that story, right? One is the customer thing I already mentioned. The second is, um, interests are massively misaligned. So one of the things that gets very confusing for entrepreneurs, it was confu I, was, I didn't understand it at all at that point, it took me years to figure this out, is there's a very, um, there's a very complex dance that happens between an, an entrepreneur and the investor. When you're, once they're in and you're building the company and there's no deal on the table, you are completely aligned. You are both all about building that business. The second there is a dollar on the table, you are on opposite sides. There is one pie and one of you is going to get that dollar. And the trick is, I have done this, I bet I'm in the top 1%, forget female of anybody in terms of how many times I've done this. I've done it 12 times over an entire career, right? I've been doing this for 30 years now. I've done it 12 times. They do 12 times every two years. They know how to do this inside and out, right? It's like the professional figure stater and I go twice a year. Who's, who's going to win that game, right? So you've got to understand, don't bring a, you know, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You've got to understand what it is you're in. Don't show up. Don't do it that way. So that's, that's sort of an, another thing is just understanding where you're aligned and, and, and where you're not aligned. And then the last is, is persistence, right? It would have been really easy to go like, well, don't do that, right? That, that doesn't work, right? You just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it and keep at it and keep at it until you literally just can't, all right? So that's one story. Um, the, second, the second one um, is about, uh, I was going to tell a story of Turntide. So Turntide was an anti-spam company. Um, David Brewson and I founded it in January of 2004 we got $700,000 in uh, funding for it um, from the grandson of one of the guys who had done Destiny, the deal I just told you, the guys in Long Island, um, and, a, and um, another VC fund, Liberty Associated Partners, and then some angels. We sold it uh, six months later to Symantec for $20 million. We had a total of about hundred grand in revenue. Um, it always sounds like people tell a story, and it's sort of an amazing story, and it was. Um, the, our, our performance was genuinely just outrageously good. Outrageously good. We were six months old, and we had clients including Merck, Edward Jones Brokerage, University of Pennsylvania. We were in trial at the largest mail processing facility that exists still today. It was genuinely absolutely outrageously great. Um, and we had, we had 12 term sheets when we sold. We sold, we had $305 in the bank, and my team used it to buy skateboards. They bought me these, uh, these logo skateboards. Um, but the way that happened, so it sounds like, and this is my last story, my last point, the way that happened was a year plus of just dogged effort from me. So w the way it all worked, what happened was that this is my co-founder, David, had invented this technology. He was inside another company. And the CEO of that other company, I knew we'd been both CEOs in another VC's portfolio. 
uh, during the heyday in 99, and he wanted me to come run his company, but I thought the company was stupid. This idea I thought was amazing, right? And there was sort of, there was a patent application, that was it at that point. And a patent just got issued like six months ago, all these years later. Um, and I said to him, I would like, I, I want to spin it out. There's no way you're getting funding for existing company for a whole long reason I won't go into. Let me, I'll take David, the inventor, and the patent, and I'll, I didn't have any money. I hadn't made any money at that point yet. Um, I'll, I'll buy it for stock, and then I'll be able to fund the company. And he wouldn't do it, and wouldn't do it, and wouldn't do it for all kinds of reasons that turned out to be stupid. And um, what ended up turning the twist was the opposite experience of the investor. It was Josh Koppelman, who, who if, you, if you're in this game and you don't know, shame on you. Um, was, was an old friend of mine. I'd worked for him before. It was his granddad who was the one in, in Long Island with this long relationship. And I called Josh and I said, you know, I'm trying to decide what to do with my life. I had two little kids. I'm the, my, my husband's the stay-at-home husband, so I'm like the sole support, I like all this stuff. And he, um, he said, I'll put the money in. The deal never would have happened if he hadn't had the foresight and sort of just trust it. it was, there was nothing there. And so I was able to take that piece and bring it back to the guy who owned the company and say, I actually have dollars here. You know, it was one thing when I was going and saying, here, I'm going to do this theoretical thing. When I came back and said, here's the money, right, that will fund this company and you're going to own X of it and it's way more probable it's going to be successful if you give it to me and let me do it. Um, that same investor, Josh, when we were, we were trying to decide whether to sell or not, and it was a very difficult decision. There were, it, we were going gangbusters. It was in all likelihood going to be a half a billion dollar plus exit if we, if we executed well versus 28 now. But for both David and I, it was a life-changing event. And so as opposed to sort of the greedy investor, Josh just looked at us, just, he pulled me aside one day. We were literally walking into a board meeting. He pulled me aside and he said, what do you want? How do you want me to vote? And I said, I want to go. And so that's what he did. He voted his shares, despite the fact that there was all kinds of controversy. So the investor side can be horrible, just horrible, or it can be amazing, right, and make the company happen. It's all at the end of the day about who they are. And you got to be persistent enough to get the right guys, to get it at all and, and to get the right guys. So those are my two stories. Um, I will do a five-minute commercial or less, two-minute commercial for Real Food Works. So, uh, in 2000, summer 2011, we sold my last company, Channel Intelligence, uh, to uh, Click Equations to Channel Intelligence. Um, and I saw a movie called Forks Over Knives. Has anyone seen Forks Over Knives? A couple people. Um, it affected me really deeply. I'm a New Yorker and fundamentally cynical, so I sort of didn't believe it. Um, and I went and did a ton of work, and it turns out that what the movie said was true, which is basically we're killing ourselves with food. That the standard American diet literally is killing us. It's what gives us heart disease, diabetes, and many, many, the most, the most virulent forms of cancer. And I didn't know that. I really didn't understand that. And I got pissed about it. I got sort of political about it. And then I changed the way I ate. And I've always been pretty fit, but um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 50s and I was starting to have like, diff I'm an athlete and I was starting to have difficulty recovering and all this and I'm really arthritic and it just was amazing to me that I could go from a really what anybody would call a healthy diet to actually eating plant-based and metamorphosize. Um, literally I have no joint pain anymore after having, I've been through everything and just gone. My energy levels are up here just constantly. I don't peak and valley like I used to, on and on and on. And so I thought, well, this is interesting, right? And while I was doing all that research to figure out whether to do it, I um, came to the conclusion there was a trend towards, under, towards people understanding that what we eat is related to our health. That generally, not necessarily specifically about plant-based, although it turns out that's happening too. But it's really hard. It's actually not hard if you go plant-based. It's not hard at all motivationally. After about a month, you literally just don't want anything else. There's no, there's no cravings for it. You just don't. You don't want anything else. But, but logistically, it's like impossible. You can't, we, we go to dinner and there's literally not a thing on the menu I, I eat, literally. If I have to eat like one you know, garden salad, I, 
and I'm a huge food person, right? I'm a huge foodie. I've always been gourmet. My brother was a Cordon Bleu chef, the big thing. So I was like, we got to solve this problem. So there's a big trend towards it. There's a thing that works, but it's really hard. You're entrepreneurs, right? You get that. There's a gap there. And so I started ideating, and then I'm driving. I had a business meeting on a Tuesday in an empty restaurant, like every restaurant is empty on a Tuesday in the middle of the day. And Uber was entering Philly. I'm from Philly. It was entering Philadelphia at the same time. And I just had this brainstorm. Well, wait a second. Why couldn't I use the excess capacity in restaurants to produce food that's actually healthy? And so that's what we do. So we launched. We uh, I founded the company in May of last year. Um, we've delivered over 35,000 meals. What we do is we have a network of 20 plus local independent restaurants. We give them very stringent dietary guidelines. They produce the meals to our requirements, and then consumers, customers, are subscribed to our service. And they can get you can get five, 10, 15 meals. Or we have a weight loss program that's new that is coaching and a portal and stuff too. Um, and we deliver the food every week. So it's, it's an amazing win, 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 win. So the restaurants get business when they could never get it otherwise. We're as much for our core restaurants. We're 20% of their business already, about a year in. Um, amazing for our customers. The customers just love it. Our retention is super high, and it's great for us because we don't have the infrastructure costs. Kitchens are actually super expensive. Um, so that's what we do, and I have postcards. The big exciting thing that's happening, we, did, you know, we raised money earlier in the year. As I said, that wasn't so exciting, but we are pretty sure um, we're going to open nationally. We thought we were going to have to go locally step by step, but um, we're in testing right now that so far has been going great, and so you can gift. We're just, we just today launched gifting, so you could give a week of food to anybody anywhere, um, and I got postcards to hand out for that. So that's my advertisement for today. You should all try it. And at a minimum, if you don't try our service, go learn about how powerful it is to start actually eating a healthy diet. It's, it's sort of amazing. I've seen transformation. Maybe there are 400 customers over time so far, and it's just, it's unbelievable, the transformation people have. Mental acuity, sleep better, it's on and on and on and on. So what can I answer for people? What are people wondering? Her Being an entrepreneur at your level, what's the most important lesson you've learned so far? The most important lesson I've learned so far, which I guess I knew, and it's so trite, it, it, it's, um, it's all about the people. It's about, the, it's about your team, it's about yourself more than anything, honestly. It's about the investors, it's about the, your customer, it's about the people. It, everything can get solved with the right people. Best idea in the world with the wrong people, you're screwed. Oh. You got the right people, you'll figure it out. Yeah. In dealing with um, startups, yeah. I think some of the things we're trying to do is succeed are important, but sometimes unnecessary. So what would you consider what um, people would think are really important? But so what's important but not really, but isn't but really? Boy, that is a really good question. Um, I don't know. I don't often get stumped. Um, well, I'll tell you some very tactical things, and if, as I'm answering tactically, I'll see if I can come up with something grander. Um, the first thing is a business plan. Give them up. We don't do them anymore. You don't need to. It's stupid. Everybody knows it's stupid. You need a back of the envelope model that shows that the business fundamentally works, that lays out a set of assumptions that you can then test against. The, I, can't, I mean, it's, people come to me sometimes, they haven't quit their job yet, and yet they have these 50-page documents. Like, what do you don't know jack shit? Until you have been in the market and tried to sell somebody something, you don't know anything. The reason you're going to learn about 55 is because you've got something in the market, and your customers are going to tell you whether it's too cheap or not. I mean, I was joking about that just to make you feel better. So we, we, lived, a, we lived a year and a half with a, with a $99 logo, and people loved it. We got rave reviews on it. So I think 55 seems perfectly reasonable. I said, I, you know, I'm bummed I overpaid. Um, <laughs> and now my in-house my in designer just did a new one that we love. So I, that, I think that's one. Um, a second one is um, just over, that, that is really the thing. It's planning. Just do it. Just get out and do it. Build, sell something to somebody. If you can sell it and then build it, that's really the way to do it. That was one of the problems, actually one of the things I didn't like about Real Food Works before I started is there was no way to sell it before you built it. We had to go get the food and then sell it. It worked out fine, happily, but I was really nervous about that. In software, I've always done that, right? There's nothing wrong with selling vaporware. 
it's better to be honest about it, I think, but that's the thing. Stop thinking about things, stop planning, stop meeting. I always say to my people, the answer is not in these four walls. The answer is out there. Get out and talk to somebody, pick up the phone. So that's probably the one, yeah. I've always put together, I've always put together, I've had board of advisors in every one of my companies. They tend to be more, um, they're more for marketing purposes, like they're people who have, are, like now we have one that's actually pretty heavy duty because we have these specific areas of expertise that I can't afford to hire yet, so I've put them on the advisory board. I've had a board of directors from the beginning, and actually I have a really close friend who, had a, who has a company that's in the middle of going belly up, um, and my biggest thing to him was, you he wanted, he wanted to not, he put a bunch of friends on this board of directors and it wasn't a real thing and he was doing it so he didn't have to worry about it or whatever. Huge mistake, right? First of all, you don't, first of all, you get um, actual expertise and knowledge of somebody who's actually in the game. It's completely different to sort of be in the game and be on the hook and officially be on a board that meets regularly and all that than just getting advice. The second thing is, the reason it's so important to me even more than that, is it's accountability. So I have a board meeting tomorrow. I got to stop this last weekend. What did I do? I did board prep, which, you know, board prep, if you guys haven't done it yet, is a huge pain in the ass at any level. Even at my level, I'm putting together a 50, you know, slide deck. But it's accountability. It makes me stop and think through the business in a methodical way. And then I've got to talk to people about it in between when I'm fundraising. So Super, super valuable. Even if I didn't raise any outside money, I'd put a board of directors in place day one, immediately. Yeah. Yeah, so a uh, real food question. It was interesting you said that you have like 400 customers and you've seen this transformation, right? Have you thought about doing like maybe what I would call like a scientific case study on top of that? Yeah, we're actually, um, we're doing two things with that. We've been looking for a while now for a student to help us. We've got, we've got, we think the rest of it lined up, so testing and stuff, but we really need like a medical, we need someone in medical or it could be nutritional sciences or something who would be the person who would like design it properly. It's and like a clinical trial. So it's a clinical trial, that's exactly right. And there's actually, there's no, I mean, there's a number of them. The, the work originally comes out of, if people have heard Dean Ornish or Caldwell Esselstyn or those are the guys whose work it came out of, but we do, we have this sort of set right there ready to go. The other thing we're doing, which we don't have yet, is because we launched weight loss, um, which I was loath to do. I had a very funny, talk about investors, a very funny, experience. So we launched it two months ago and we, we decided to do that about a month before and we had a board meeting. We had this board meeting in September and I'm walking through. I, you know, I'd sent them the materials in advance so they know we're doing this weight loss program and one of the investors were going through the whole thing. He's very soft spoken. He said, am I recalling correctly that three months ago you told me you would never do a weight loss program? Yes, I think I did say that, as a matter of fact. Um, but what we realized is it's, it's um, the most accessible way. People, you hate to say it, I can tell you all I want about your health if I explain to you, which is completely true, that the weight will just melt off painlessly. That is the thing that will make you sign up. So that's why we launched weight loss. But now we have the same thing. We've got the study for the scientific side. We need the before and afters. Super hard to do. This stuff is like so much harder than software. You got all these people and... Uh, it was so much harder. It's customers, yeah. Um, I'm curious about scaling. Scaling, yeah. Because I'm in the food business, so uh, the diet that we're serving is about a billion dollars. Yep, that's right. It's about a billion. It's strong. Yep. So where, where do you see yourself going? Because that is a niche market. Yeah, um, so ultimately, we, I think we have a strategic <coughs> why that's going to happen about a year from now. So we have a delivery plat. We have this platform that really does work, right? Really, what we've built. I say it's a technology company, right? Supply chain. We don't make food. All I do is sort of define requirements and 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 track it. Um, we may take that platform and use it for all kinds of food. I think that's unlikely because we really are mission driven, right? I. So I think what we'll take is the other side of that why, which is about we'll first add meal kits and then we'll do packaged products, and then we'll do, the first one actually we're going to do probably is social and content, so you create an online community. So I think um, 
you know, real food and, and our, our whole thing we're, we're doing now is all around living real, branding kind of living real. And I think there's a real opportunity to create a lifestyle brand that's around this new ethic of people don't want processed shit anymore in, in their life in general, right? Really not, you, you look at the cosmetics business and the, it's, it's an overarching trend that people want actual real things. So I think that's where we're gonna go and sort of move away from being a quote unquote food company, but hard to say. Yeah, um, he, a, anybody who saw Forks Over Knives gets preference in question asking. Um, I'm joking. Another great um, uh, documentary is Dive. I haven't seen that? Dive, no. Okay. That's about the waste of the food, but the oh, process yes, of solution of logistics. Um, if you could look into that. And I see will, I totally will. Logistic capability to solve the hunger problem. Yeah, I totally because will. Because it's all about logistics, I believe, and um, you know, volunteers and trucking. So it might be an extension. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I will totally look at that. There's a guy, one of our investors is looking at, there's a guy in Boston who did a big deal, and I can't remember why he's a big deal. He was He's a tech guy who is um, open, has opened up storefronts and restaurants using expired product. I don't know if people know, but mostly expired product is good yes. way past the expiration date. So, it's yeah. It's a Harvard study about it, actually. It's a Harvard study about it? Yeah, the food waste thing is just unbelievable. We waste, we waste close to half of the food that we produce. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a question about It's a disease, that's what's the matter. <laughs> all right, so, so, so there's all different people, there's all different ways. Steve Jobs did, right, he did Next in the Middle, but he did it for his whole career. Bill Gates did one company. First company I worked for at business school was SEI Investments. He, the guy's 75, still running it. It's a $3 billion company. People do it all different ways. I mean, I, I don't think I'd be good at running a big company. I'm incredibly impatient. I have no ability to deal with anybody sort of telling me anything about reality. Those are really positive attributes when you're a startup. And actually, if you don't have those attributes, you're going to have a really hard time getting started. Um, but get to 200 people, and I'm fine, you know, we were, Destiny was 175 people, I was still fine. But you start to get like into 500 people, I'm not gonna be any good at that. And the truth is what, what people I think who are good at this are driven by is the creating, creating a reality out of nothing, right? It's about building things and the way engineers build things but on a kind of on a grander scale, if you will. So it gets boring after that. And like in the case of Turntide, one of the reasons we sold, it was 90% that we wanted the life-changing event, but it was also that Symantec at that time, they're even bigger now, Symantec at that time had 4,000 sales reps. I had three. We were trying to, we were really genuinely trying to save the world from spam. Let's give it to the 3,000 sales reps, right? Um, now the story turns a little, that's not exactly what ended up happening, but um, spam part of your diet, definitely not. I would check every box that you don't do. Yeah. That's, I wanted to find out, like, what is your diet? Because yeah. my wife and I have a food website. We oh, really? We changed our diet. Yep. Because I have some health issues. And I'm now, a, I call myself a half a vegetarian. Half a vegetarian? That's better than enough. Breakfast and lunch. Breakfast and lunch. <laughs> You're like vegan before six. Have you read Mark Bain's like book? I'm have you, vegetarian. Have, you, have, you, have you, well, he's almost all the time. He's pretty vegan. Have well, you read, have you read? Me, but, you know. Very rare. He's fish once in a blue moon. Um, have you read Mark Bittman's Vegan Before Six? No. You totally should. VB6 is on the bestseller list. It's that. So the, the diet specifically is the biggest tenant is nothing processed. I Literally nothing processed. No refined sugar, no refined flour, certainly nothing that comes in a, in a box. That's the biggest. Tons of vegetables and particularly green, uh, leaf, dark leafy greens, fruits, um, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, no dairy. I eat personally no meat, um, any, kind of, any kind of meat product. A lot of people eat some, but not a lot. Like some might be three times a week and a, and a small portion. And then um, close to no oil or salt. 
So it sounds super constrictive in a sense, but there's like 40 kinds of meat or something. There's 15,000 kinds of vegetables. And so once you get in your, you get your head around it, it really is amazingly fulfilling. Right, you can eat, I eat literally as much as I want of anything in that. I just, I, I have always been a big eater. I just eat, you know, I'm big and whatever. I eat tons. You never feel deprived. It's super interesting once you learn how to cook. I mean, my poor family got dragged along for this ultimately. And um, at first, I just didn't know how to make stuff taste good, right? You take oil out, how do you make it taste good? How do, how do restaurants make food taste good? Salt, sugar, and fat. There's, there, you are, if you walk into a restaurant, you are just pouring salt, sugar, and fat into yourself. And I can explain to you everything horrible that that is doing to you and how it's resulting in, in the diseases that you have. A huge amount, a number of the diseases that you have. So you learn how to cook without that. It was hard. So I would literally sort of put things down in front of my kids and go like... And I didn't make it. I was like, this tastes terrible. You're right, it tastes terrible. So you have to re-educate sort of everything to get there. But it, um, it ends up being, I mean, our customers, this is really consistent. Our, we actually had a really funny testimonial last week. What, someone, a week before last, someone sent us an email saying, I hated the food when I first started getting it. But it was so convenient and I knew it was good for me. Two months later, I love it and I can't. I don't want to eat any normal stuff. Because your palate, literally, physically, your palate changes. Like, you know, if you don't eat a lot of salt, then things taste really salty. Same exact thing happens with all the rest of that stuff. You just don't want it. What's the name of that book? Uh, well, this is, I mean, this is... Uh, vegan Before Six, VB6, Mark, B, Mark Bittman. I just mentioned that because it's a... He said, he, he said that he, that's what he does at Six. The, the, the single biggest book for it, it it's, it's the body of scientific evidence. So the single biggest one is the China study. There's also, there's Dean Ornish's initial work. The work is literally in Nature, The Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA. It's that level of stuff. It just isn't popularized, because why? Because you can't make a buck off broccoli, that's why, right? Every food lobby is against it. The medical lobby is against it. The pharma lobby is against it. But I think there's sort of going to be a grassroots thing, because there's a lot of people like me who start to do it, and you go like, man, this is unbelievable. And it's, it spreads person, person to person. And eventually, I sort of believe in America, right? Eventually, we're, it gets there. It's just going to be hard. All right. Yeah. Great comments. Great insights. Thank you. The, uh, so what are, the challenges, what are you worrying about these days as you scale the company? And what, do you have any sense on the numbers? And what types of numbers are you looking at? So we're running just under a million dollar run rate a year and a half in. Um, for a food business, that's great. Um, what I, man, what don't I worry about? This, this is, a hard, this is um, the hardest company I've ever done by far. It is the most fun I've ever done by like far by far. You know, I hang out at a place where, you know, you're walking into a meeting and you know how everyone's gathering before and normally people are talking about the weather or sports or whatever. The only topic in our office is food. So you're sitting down and someone's talking about the watermelon turnips that they got yesterday and some are in. Um, so it's great, but it is unbelievably hard. It's just unbelievably hard. So we have problems like it snows. It snows on my delivery day. Like, uh, you can't, the, the ramifications of that are just like you want to shoot yourself over. And mostly it's scale, right? If, if the national shipping thing is as successful, it works as well as it looks like it's going to, three quarters of my agenda it goes away. But until those things happen, right, the business doesn't work yet. So I got a back end that works, I don't have a front end that works yet. I, until the business works. Once a business works for me, it's all, it's all downhill. Right now, it's, it's all good problems. I know how to deal with everyone, but until it works, it's, it's, I don't actually never lose sleep. I sleep well, but metaphorically, it's sleepless nights. So that's what I'm worried about is how the hell do I market this thing? How do I get enough customers? I know I can be profitable. I know they stay when I get them. I don't know how to get them yet. Any competition? I'm really not worried about competition, right? It's a huge market, as he said. He's exactly right. It's a billion-dollar market. All the other competitors suck. We use every single, we've, we've secret shopped every one of them. The food is just terrible. And, uh, and the food is terrible. And food, it matters like if food is good. It really matters a lot. So I'm not so worried about competition. It's a huge market. Yeah. Are you uh, proactively going out to your customers to feed them? How do you get Oh, endlessly. So one of the things that's amazing to me we don't have in the platform yet is we don't have reviews or thumb up or thumbs down. I think part of the reason is because we interact with them just constantly. Food is super personal. 
And for people who are not weight loss, for weight loss this is a familiar model, getting a food delivery. For other people, I mean, you wouldn't normally do that, right? You just, it's not a thing you do. So those customers have made this commitment to a change in how they eat, not just what they eat, but how, right? The method the food gets to them, which, which ends up resulting in this very close relationship with them. And so we talk to them constantly. They email us and then we've done now, we're in the third, we're right in the middle of the third, we literally just stop and talk to every single customer. We have hour long conversations, if I can do them face to face, I do, I do as many as I possibly can myself and like try to under, get inside it. Wh what is it? Like it, it, the first group we did of those, really sort of, sort of interesting, the main thing came out, which is wonderful for any marketers in the room, the key benefit of the service is that they feel like they're living according to their values. So especially anybody who's working, there are not a lot of women in the room, but any working moms in the room, we feel constantly stressed and out of balance. We are constantly making trade-off decisions where we know something is bad, right? All of a sudden you get this service and you feel right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm out tonight, my kids at home with the babysitter, they'll pull Real Food Works meals out of their fridge. I feel great about that fact, right, even if it wasn't my company. So th there's this higher, and that all came out of talking to people, right, the self-actualization, um, ties to the environment and everything else. Trying to get into grocery stores at all? Get into grocery stores, yeah, we're actually, so we're, we're, we've, had, we've, um, we've had quite a uh, conversation with Whole Foods Market. The challenge is that margins don't work. Um, you know, we're end-to-end, -end, so we, we can afford to pay more and still have plenty of margin given all the stuff we have to do. The grocery stores need, A, a low price point. Our, our meals are not cheap. It's a premium service now. Um, and then there's just not enough room and margin. So they would love to do it if I could make the dollars work. If we're bigger, we may be able to, but now we can't make the dollars work. But, but let him go first, because you already asked one. Two more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you're getting restaurants with the, the excess capacity to sign up, They do. They do. So the entire supply chain is designed to be completely lean. There's zero waste in it. So the customer orders come in and are paid for before we place the order with a restaurant. And the restaurant and the timing of that is designed so that the restaurant has time to order provisions and get them before they have to cook. So there's zero waste in the whole thing because yeah, they have totally we have totally different requirements. So we do offer meat. We're two a week right now. We're going to five a week. Um, and we require Whole Foods level four. So every, every type of meat is organic, pastured, free range, line, wild caught, all that stuff. It's really expensive. They don't carry that stuff normally. Right. So yeah, that's how, we, that's how we do that. What markets are you in right now? And is it a delivery service or is it a pick? It's delivery. So it's delivery and right now we're in the greater um, Philadelphia MSA, but we're testing national and I'd be actually really happy if anybody wanted to be in the alpha group to take, to take shipping. The plans right now are 89 for five meals, um, 149 for 10, 189 for 15, and 299 a week for weight loss. Weight loss is all, all the meals and it has coaching and stuff in, in it too. They're all gonna change in the new year, but they're, those, are still, those are still prices and active for now www.realfoodworks.com. Thank you, Daryl. Last question. Do your restaurants notice an increase in business? Yes, they do. And we try so hard to get our customers to tell them that they're from us. And they rarely do, but they do enough that the restaurants kind of get it. Um, the other, it's a real problem, though, because you can't get today, we're working on this with the restaurants, but you can't get the food that they do for us in the restaurant. So we get all these complaints. We know how often the, our customers go because they complain. They say, I went and it was terrible. It was all oily and greasy and what? Yeah, because they take a lot of shit out for us. They don't do it on the menu. So yeah, they get decent traffic. And the, average, and the marketing, the value proposition for the, for the restaurants is very clear, right? It's revenue at a time they could never get it. It's very profitable revenue. It's re predictable, right? You're all entrepreneurs. Imagine you're a restaurant. It snowed, you're screwed. Our order still came in. So it's repeated and then they get the marketing angle. So they're celebrated, they're on the labels, they're in the menus, they're on the website, they're, so they like that whole side of it too.
I'm getting cut off, but people keep asking me questions. All right, one last one, because he got okay. me to say the website. What was the most deciding factor that made your company get acquired by investors or larger corporations? And what would you say was the best way to acquire new customers? Was it cold call? Was it email? Was it public relations? Was it strategy? So um, how do you get customers? Actually, well, I'll skip that one, because I think that answer is so company specific. That completely depends on what's happening with the company. Um, how do you, I do have an opinion, though, about how you get acquired, which is you work closely with companies, right? And what, what has happened to me every time, one, one exception, there was a company that was going sideways. We sold proactively that we weren't working with the company that bought us, but all the others, it's an existing relationship. It's already clear how the fit works. So can I take two seconds, because you're all exhausted, I am too, but I want to tell the story about how the Turntide sale to Symantec happened. So there is a super secret, not so much anymore because I'm telling you, <laughs> um, group of anti-spam professionals. They still to this day meet on a monthly basis in a San Francisco restaurant. There's about, there's about 12 or 15 of them at any given time. And they are people who have to deal with or are supplying products to spam. And they literally, it's a secret society so that you can't get, the spam thing is really aggressive and horrible and right, literally criminal in a lot of cases, it's a mess. So in that meeting was our inventor, Dave Brusen, um, and the guy who ran the Symantec tech infrastructure, the internal, just the IT guy, because you'd imagine Symantec is just pounded with every kind of threat and everything else. So he agreed to, to, to be one of our alpha customers. They put a box in. So meanwhile, totally separate thread, the M&A guys, the corp dev guys, are looking to buy a spam solution because spam's a big problem and obviously that Symantec would need it in their suite. So every time they would get to a certain level with a potential acquisition, they would test it by putting it in the Symantec network. So they ultimately bought Brightmail right before they bought us, which was a very large acquisition. So the third time the M&A guy called our guy down in the basement, right, you can see him in the bowels with the machines and all the rest, and said, we need you to, we need you to test this other machine, we need you to test this system. And our guy got pissed and said, direct quote, no fucking way. Every time I take the turntide box out, the system crashes and I'm here all night. I'm not testing another one of these for you guys. And the corp dev guy said, What's Turntide? <laughs> and that's how it happened. They called us and tested, and it was there, there we were. So I think that that's very consistent, is you sell to people that you work with, right? There's some clear value prop. There's some clear way that they fit together. In the case of Click Equations, Channel Intelligence, we've been working with them for three, four years before the, before the acquisition happened. So thanks, everybody. I've got postcards I'll pull out.